How's everybody doing? My name is Anthony Brian Logan, and today I bring you a recap of the first presidential debate of the 2020 election cycle for the Democratic Party, which was last night. That was Wednesday, June 26, 2019. There will be a second one tonight, which is Thursday, June 27th. I may be able to cover that, maybe not, but I digress. Let's get into the first part of this very first debate in the 2020 cycle for the Democratic Party. I don't even know where to start. I guess I should just tell you who was in the debate. You had Cory Booker, a.k.a. Spartacus, Bill de Blasio, Julian Castro, John Delaney, Tulsi Gabbard, Jay Inslee, Amy Klobuchar, Beto O'Rourke, Tim Ryan, and Pocahontas, a.k.a. Elizabeth Warren. Now, <laughs> there was a lot of virtue signaling here. I mean, it was all over the place straight from the beginning. Pocahontas, I think she was able to speak first and she was talking about, well, the economic gains, like she was trying to like mock it. The economic gains aren't helping the black community. It's like, wait a minute. Hold on. <laughs> wait a minute, Pocahontas. I think that you're not really the one to speak on that necessarily because you're not making the decisions right now in the administration and you're not a person that would be able to see what's happening on the ground. And if you're looking at it just from the outside, the numbers speak for themselves. The lowest black unemployment rate ever, very low Hispanic unemployment rates, very low unemployment rates for the entire nation, for all peoples, white, black, Puerto Rican, Kenny Stripe, everybody. So that was just virtue signaling to try and pander and cater to the lowest common denominator. But moving right along, Pocahontas to stay on her for a minute she also called us a democracy we are not a democracy we are a constitutional republic okay ain't no democracy you can't just go out there and vote you know 51 if we were a democracy then hillary clinton would have won because popular vote would have been how it was determined but that's not what we have here okay we have elements of democracy in our government but we are not a democracy and i think that same falsehood about us being a democracy was repeated more than once during this debate. And by the way, the debate was probably about two hours or so. You know, I started streaming right around 8.30 just to get a heads up on it. And they ended right about 11 and it started at 9 p.m. Exactly. But move right along. I got my notes here. So if I glance at the screen, you know what I'm doing. Um, Bill de Blasio was there and for some reason got a lot of applause when he would say certain things. It was really weird. He was talking about Russia. He was talking about his black son. You know, I got to raise my black son, biracial, but I got to raise my black son and I got to tell him about being out there on the street and dealing with the police. He is a person that kind of baffles me because his confidence is like a person that is loved by a city, that is loved by his constituents, but he is hated in New York City, you know, especially by the leftists. Nobody likes this guy in his city. The police definitely don't like him. He brought the police. So I'm like, okay, the police don't like you, sir. And then when he said something about his son and having to do with the police, that comment is a big part of the reason why the police don't like him. He's throwing them under the bus, labeling them as just hunting black males. That ain't the case. So I did not understand the applause, even for a liberal audience, because like I said, even the so-called progressives in New York hate Bill de Blasio, but we'll move right along. There was a certain point in the debate where they switched moderators. I think in the beginning they had uh, Savannah Guthrie, Lester Holt, and Jose diaz Villart. We'll get to Jose in a minute. But when they switched to Cup Tide and Rachel Maddow, um, a microphone malfunction happened. It was really weird. So they were trying to ask questions for like, it felt like an eternity, probably about two or three minutes. Um, but the people on stage couldn't really respond. I think it was Pocahontas that had to respond, but she couldn't really respond. You were hearing microphones from other people. It was really weird. They cut to a break and got back. It was hilarious. Trump uh, actually tweeted about that. He was like, look, man, I got to tighten up. You can't even get your microphones together. This is embarrassing. And it was a really embarrassing moment. You would think that NBC would have enough cash to be able to avoid having that really embarrassing moment but we'll move on from that speaking about jose diaz Bellart, he was super dramatic he asked a question about 
I think it was family separation or those that are dying on the way to the U.S. trying to seek asylum, quote unquote. He was like, what about Maria? She dies in the water. It's like, Doc, this is not a telenovela. You are on television moderating a debate. He also asked a question in Spanish. It's like, OK, sir, this is being simulcast on Telemundo. And if it's not available in your house, I'm sure you can push the SAP button on your remote and get Spanish. So you don't need to speak in Spanish right now. OK. You got a whole network under NBC or together with NBC under Univision, if I'm not mistaken, that is showing this right now to Spanish speaking people and they're translating in real time. Speaking about the Spanish speakers, there was a lot of that. Uh, Beto, a.k.a. Bobby Frank O'Rourke, came out and spoke in Spanish right from the jump. Right from the beginning, it's like, all right, man, I get it. You want to call yourself Beto. You want to pose as this Hispanic guy, even though, like I said, your name was Bobby Frank, Robert Francis or worker straight from Ireland. You know, you and Conor McGregor got more in common than you and uh, Jose Diaz Bilar or somebody like that. But I digress. The Spanish was ridiculous. You saw Beto speak Spanish, Julian Castro. I was kind of you know, impressed that Julian Castro did not speak Spanish after Bobby Frank, but then he spoke it towards the end of the debate. I was like, all right, man, you know, I thought you were going to be different, but he wasn't. You also had Spartacus, AKA Cory Booker speak Spanish horribly stuttering and stuff like that. Now I know I'm not the most, you know, eloquent speaker in the world, but if you're going to speak Spanish on stage, make sure you get it right. It was really embarrassing. There was no actual need to do that because like I said, it's on Telemundo. You want to impress me, you know, speak some Aztec, speak some Mandarin Chinese, speak some French or something like that. You know, you're talking about you want to be inclusive while it's already being translated in Spanish. Speak some kind of obscure language. And then one more thing about the Spanish speaking. They are assuming that all the so-called migrants speak Spanish. That ain't the case. I did a video a little while ago about African so-called asylum seekers that came from Congo by way of Ecuador speaking French. Okay. And like I said, you got Chinese people that come over here that don't really speak very good English, speaking Mandarin, Canto, et cetera. You got those that may come from other European countries speaking German or speaking Russian, whatever. And speaking about Russia, that was brought up here. Bill de Blasio got a roar of applause talking about Russia's interfering with the election And they did speak about Trump a little bit, but not as much as you may think. You know, he was obviously the underlying thing. They all wanted to go out here and beat him. They want to go against his policies. That was the overarching theme. But they did not really address Trump specifically until later on in the debate. And Russia was brought up. And of course, Bill de Blasio got an enormous round of applause for that comment. You know, I think that was brought up when they were asked, What is the biggest threat to Americans right now? Some said China. Some said Russia. I think one guy said Trump and others said climate change. And speaking about climate change, that was a really big topic here. They're talking about, you know, we want to have green energy and we don't want to do coal. A lot of lies were spoken talking about we can get by on solar panels and wind turbines. First of all, how much carbon emission does it take to manufacture wind turbines and solar panels? Number one. Number two, can you run an entire energy grid on that? And the whole thing about global warming and climate change, just a boogeyman. They're talking about, oh, you know, Miami's flooding and some of these towns by rivers are flooding. It's like, well, you don't say if you got a town by a river you are close to water so it could flood same thing with miami you are in south florida there's swamps everywhere parts of the city if not the entire city are below sea level so of course it's going to flood and you're also prone to hurricanes remember hurricane andrew and stuff like that so you're going to get flooding in a place like miami it's going to happen if you are in a coastal part of the country or by a large body of water That's natural to happen, but they want to put that on the back of climate change. But I digress away from that. A lot of radical ideas were said here. 70 percent tax rate. One thing that really got me was when the idea of abortion on demand covered by Medicaid was brought up. And I think pretty much everybody supported that. That was really scary. Julian Castro said that 
he supports abortions for trans people, you know, because the conversation was about women and women's rights is there. And the third, he was like, well, how about trans people? And I was like, all right, come on, man. Like you, you, you're doing way too much. Stop it. All right. But the idea of government pay abortions is ridiculous. Okay. You're going all the way to the left. And that's part of the reason why these people don't have much traction. Okay. They're going way too far left. Now, there were some that were kind of moderate, kind of center, some of the more unknown people who sounded okay. I think Amy Klobuchar sounded okay at certain points in time. And a couple of the other guys, I forget their name, but I put their names in the box. They sounded somewhat moderate, although I would still not vote for them. They're still Democrats, but they didn't sound as extreme as some others that were on the panel. Now, speaking about moderates, I got to bring up Tulsi Gabbard. She did not do very well here, in my humble opinion. That's not because I'm not a fan of Democrats or anything. I'm just being honest. She had this whole stick of being anti-war and her reasoning for being anti-war justified because she was in the military. That's what she pretty much did all night. There was a question asked about the pay gap between genders, and she went off on this whole thing about well, we don't need to get in any kind of wars and regime changes. Like, okay, uh, pay got you want to answer that one? So that was her whole thing all throughout the night. And I'm not sure what was going on with her hair. She had kind of a gray street like rogue from X-Men. But I digress. She did not do very well in my humble opinion. She just pretty much reiterated her whole thing, which is being anti-war. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But at a certain point, you got to have more to you rather than just that one issue. So I think that pretty much sums it up. A lot of Spanish speaking, a lot of appeal to, you know, so-called downtrodden people, people of color. That was Cory Booker's whole thing. I live in a low-income black neighborhood. That's your choice to live there, sir. Okay, you don't have to be there. You could live somewhere else. You live in there because it's kind of a campaign thing. And he was really weird throughout this as normal. As big as dinner plates, that was really distracting me. Um, out of everybody here, the best uh, performer was probably one of the unknown guys. I forget my man's name. Uh, not the guy from Ohio, but somebody else. Uh, I want to say it was, uh, was it John Delaney, Jay Ansley? One of those guys. They probably did the best. Uh, the worst was probably uh, Beto. You know, his, Beto's whole thing has been high energy and in your face. And this one, he was really subdued and... The immediate Spanish speaking threw me off. He didn't do well. Pocahontas did okay, I suppose, for for what she is. Uh, Cory Booker just, he had a whole stick of about being a black guy and people of color. Tulsi Gabbard was about anti-war. Uh, Julian Castro was kind of, you know, kind of a ghost, kind of irrelevant, really. I feel like he didn't get much time to speak, and that was one thing I got to say before I close. People didn't really have much time to get a word in edgewise because there were too many people on stage. Hopefully the next debate, we can have like five people. That'd be perfect. But 10 people, when I mean, you're talking about the Wu-Tang Clan, everybody trying to fight to get a chance on the mic, it was way too much. But that'd be it for now. And what do you think? Do you think that this debate was good? Was it boring, as Donald Trump said? I think it was kind of a snooze fest at certain points, but I covered it and tried to just be entertaining and make jokes like I like to do. But aside from that, it was kind of a snooze fest, kind of a thing of who can cater to what group the most, who can be the most extreme, who can stand out from each other. Nobody really stood out from each other, in my humble opinion. Everybody was pretty much the same, aside from a couple of the outsiders. Although they were a little bit different, they were not that much different. So I think I'll leave that right there for now. And whatever your comments are, Please let me know in the comments below. And that's all I got to say for this video. If you like what you heard, please comment, rate, share, and subscribe. Peace.